each and every week we're excited to bring you the Broadway show. That's why I'm so glad you're here. I'm Tamsin Fidel. We've talked about it before, but five different Pulitzer Prize winners are on Broadway this fall. That list includes cost of living. It's a look into the forces that bring people together, the complexity of caring and being cared for, and the ways that we all need each other. Let's send it out to Paul Wontorek. That's right, Tamsin. Cost of Living marks Katie Sullivan's Broadway debut. We sat down at Sardis to talk all about her incredible journey to the stage and beyond. So nice to meet you. Welcome Likewise. to Broadway. Thank you so much. You know, you've been on this journey to bring this play to Broadway for how many years? It's been about six years at this point, a little over six years um, from when I first got the script. And I'm sure when you got that script, you didn't say, this is going to bring me to Broadway. <laughs> I don't think anybody ever, when you get a new script of any sort, you don't, I don't think you dream of that. But what I did think when I got the script is how unbelievably authentic, groundbreaking, and real it was. And it terrified me, this character, her vulnerability, mm. her, um, what she's been through. Um, and then having to put a big mask on all of that with like humor and things like that. I was like, this is terrifying. I should probably do it. Yes, yeah, she is a lot. The phrase that the kids use, zero, zero Fs to give, right? There's a lot of that energy in, in her. A hundred percent. I think, I mean, I feel like Ani, has been through so much in terms of uh, what her relationship has already gone through with the sobriety and not yeah. being sober and all of these things and splitting up and getting divorced. And then on top of it, having this huge catastrophic accident that yeah. leaves her life completely turned upside down. Yeah. So coming at a character who's been through the gauntlet yeah. of life experience, there's very little that you have to do. It's all just sitting in the given circumstances is enough. The disability is almost like not the most interesting thing about her, which is what's so great about it for you, I'm sure, as an I, actress. I've done a lot of uh, TV work where it's sort of the, it's either you're a um, hero or like a tragic, something tragic is about to happen. You're right. about to be crushed by right. something or you've rescued a kitten from a tree or something like that. I mean, it's like, and there's almost no nothing in between, but to get this three-dimensional character who's flawed, who's angry, who is not looked at as a victim or a hero was extraordinary. And she's in a wheelchair. You are not in a wheelchair. You actually had to learn how to, how to be in a wheelchair for the role. Yeah, and she has different circumstances than I, than yeah. I do. She's um, a quadriplegic, so she is paralyzed from the neck down. Um, one of her arms has no movement. So like, it's this whole kind of game that I've had to figure out physically of how does one sit still? And it is way more complicated and, and way harder than it looks <laughs> to, right. to have all of this going on all of this emotion, uh, volume to fill a house and remain perfectly still. You were born without the lower halves of your legs. And from everything I've read, you, you've actually been extremely active since since you were a baby, right? Yeah, I mean, I feel like I, I started to, I got my first pair of prosthetics when I was one because I just started to stand up like babies are like, we got stuff wow. to do, like my bottle's over there, I gotta get it. So like my parents just sort of let me set the bar and they followed me and they were like, okay, she wants to walk, she wants to run, she wants to, you know, they let me kind of really fall on my face and try things and get figure out how to get back up and keep going. And, and I think that that really has played a huge role in, in just my character and my life as an adult and a professional. I also love, you said that um, your parents and your siblings never treated you like you were made of glass. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I mean, I, I was the youngest of four and I definitely got, you know, picked on and noogied and, you know, like whatever else. And no, no one ever in my family was like, oh, our poor disabled sibling or child or I just, we had stuff to do and this was part of our experience, but it didn't make up what we had to deal with on a daily basis. and. I'm so grateful for that. You discovered acting really early on. It sounds like it became a dream when, when you were pretty young. I think when you saw Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> yes, I saw a, a children's theater production in Alabama of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory when I was probably in like second grade. And the girl who played Violet went to my school. It, it was like my brain exploded because I was like, 
wait, this is something that. How did she do that? How did I could do, do that? that? And I was sort of like, you know, hold my juice box, <laughs> like, you know, let me up there. I, it's all I've ever, ever wanted to do. I saw my first um, Broadway show when I was 17. I was on a school trip. We were leaving the theater and I just was sobbing wow. uncontrollably. And my teacher came over and she was like, thought something had happened. She was like, what's wrong? What's going on? And I was like, I just want to do that so badly. <laughs> like I just, it's all I've ever wanted to do, but at that point in my life, I mean, obviously earlier, but even at 17, I had no one to point to, to say, this is possible. And I'm really glad that there are little girls out there now that have someone to yeah. point to and they can say, no, 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 this is possible. Are you feeling more doors being opened now? There's a lot more um, discussion, I think, about all kinds of diversity in, right. in, in with performers. What are you sort of hoping moving forward? I mean, I. I'm picturing you in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I mean, I would rock a <laughs> latex suit like no one else. I, I feel like that'd be incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so I let's put that guess, on the list. Right? I think that people are hungry for authenticity. Mm -hmm. And I think we're, we're really starting to get tired of seeing, you know, I, the first time I ever saw anyone who physically looked like me in a film was, you know, Gary Sinise and Forrest Gump and nothing says I feel seen like uh, to a teenage girl, but like a, you know, a veteran alcoholic who's paying hookers for sex. Like that's like, I feel And seen. it's all CGI. Right, and he's wearing green socks, which is what I found out later. Cause I was a teenager, you know, I didn't know. Right, I was like, right. oh my gosh, there is someone. Right. And then when I found out that it yeah. was CGI, I was like devastated. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. And so I think we are at a tipping point where people are interested in in the realness of telling a story mm -hmm. and not sitting an able-bodied person in a wheelchair and then you know giving them an oscar what about audience members have you been able to see the impact you're having and it will probably be far reaching way beyond even the run of the show there have been a couple of times there specifically there was a young girl who was standing outside the theater she had forearm crutches and she just said i, I just have to thank you because i had never I've never seen anything like that before. And she was like, I'm really interested in acting and I, I didn't think it was possible. And I was like, please don't give up. I was like, don't give up, take classes, go get a, you know, get jump into a scene study class, study. Because that's the other thing that, specifically in the community of individuals with disabilities, mm -hmm. is training. Luck is just opportunity meeting preparedness and people need to be prepared mm -hmm. to get up there and be ready for the moment. Right. You also became an athlete. It's almost sort of secondary Random. to all of yeah. this. <laughs> right? Because uh, because someone told you about getting the what are those prosthetics called that the I runners mean, use? Sort of people call them like blades, like running I call I used to call them running feet. Like they're sort of they're carbon fiber, they're shaped like a that's kind of like a letter J. I put them on to try them for fun, for exercise and um and I had never run before in my life before I was 25 years old. I just ended up tapping into this athletic ability that I didn't even know I possessed. I was like, well, what the heck? I might as well see where this leads. And it ended up leading to, you know, American records and Paralympics and uh, trips to the White House. I mean, it was bananas. So I was one of the first uh, bilateral above the knee amputees to compete in ambulatory track in the world. First female American to do it, first athlete to do it internationally, and um, uh, one of the first ones to get to the Paralympics on two feet, which is crazy. It was awesome. Amazing. Was awesome. Yeah.